Good morning. Would uh, welcome you this day to the house of the Lord, and with inter- with anticipation, we come with a desire that we might meet Him here, that we might experience His love, His forgiveness, and have a greater sense of His urging and His desires for us to respond unto Him. As we prepare for worship this day, let us uh, do that with singing praises unto our Heavenly Father. Um, We'll start with hymn 188, and after that we'll go straight into the uh, Praise Ye the Lord, which is in uh, the insert in your bulletin.
there's a, there's a beauty in singing praises to our Heavenly Father because those hymns, they remind us about his triumph. They remind us about uh, the sacrifice of his son, but they remind us that uh, our God is God, and he is the Lord over all things. There's no questioning. There's no wondering. There should be no doubt about his triumph and his ability to save us and to bring us back into his presence. If he is God, and that is his purpose, then there should be no doubt that he is able to do that. We gather this morning with a table spread before us. And I would like to read, um, I would like to share a, a a setting from uh, the Old Testament that might help us think about this table and these emblems a little differently. I'm reading about the Ark of the Covenant. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the, all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacles of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen, which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place to the oracle of the house into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew the staves out the staves of the ark, that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle, but they were not seen without, and there it is unto this day. And there was nothing in the ark, save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So after the ark is placed in the temple, there's a prayer in the sixth chapter of Second Chronicles, um, that Solomon offers that would, be, um, that would be worth reading. In one verse of this prayer stands out, he says, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heavens nor in the earth which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. There's a lot of references to the Ark of the Covenant in the scriptures. We hear about um, situations where those who were not sanctified or set apart and touched the Ark, they perished. We hear in this story about um, this very specific way and place of this whole temple that was built 
so that the Ark of the Covenant could stand and sit in the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant is sort of a central symbol for the people of Israel. Now we might wonder, why this thing? Well, the Lord wanted the people of Israel to have a physical symbol of the covenant that he made with them. He needed them to be able to see that this physical symbol was a tangible, was a tangible symbol of the promise that he made with them. That promise that was unbreakable. And that they might see that there is nothing more holy, nothing more sacred, nothing more important to them in their lives than was that promise. That was a promise the Lord could not break and would not break. And so he wanted to have before them, in their place of worship, in their temple, that physical reminder that the Lord God had covenanted with, had covenanted with them was on their side and was working for their salvation. And similarly, in our day, the Lord has given us a physical, tangible reminder that he has covenanted with you. And that is a promise that he has made with you. And that promise cannot be broken and will not be broken in that he is working on your behalf so that he might bring you to him. And so he's asked us to treat the, sa the sacrament as a holy thing, as a sacred thing, so that we might come to it with all seriousness and understand that there is nothing in our lives that is more important or more precious, or more worthy of our time and attention than that covenant, because that's how he sees it. And so as we worship this day, as we have the opportunity to reach forth our hands and remember that promise that we have made to join him in that, in that covenant, let us do so in remembering that our Lord and Heavenly Father has already done all that is necessary for us. He's already set the table for you and simply ask you to partake. Let us continue the, our worship this morning. With the singing of him 198, the third tune.
Father who art in heaven, ye who dwell over us, ye who dwell over your creation, Lord, in a few moments, each one of us will be on bended knee. And we do so, Lord, acknowledging you for who you are and that most perfect gift that you have given. Lord, we each come from different backgrounds. We each are indeed individuals. But you unite our hearts, Lord. Unite us in thought, knowing that uh, your Son has delivered us. And our hope and our prayer is for eternity, for each one of us. Lord, I would ask that you would bless this congregation. Bless he who is just about to occupy this pulpit. Bless him with uh, the words that you placed on his heart. Bless him with the openness that uh, he can feel free to share that which you have given him. Lord, each one of us standing here has been blessed in so many different ways, and for this we're thankful. Continue to watch over this congregation. May your praises and your glory be part of ours. And may we uh, not hesitate to share you whenever we can. Lord, then bless us to this end is my prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus who is indeed our Christ and Savior. Amen. While the emblems are prepared, let us turn to him 271.
no we deal. O oh God, the eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
us and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink it. That they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them. That they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember thee. That they may have the Spirit to be with them.
Good morning. During my uh, preparation time for today, I uh, found myself uh, going through the four Gospels, mostly the renditation and the accounts of the crucifixion. And I'd like to share just a few of those scriptures with you, and then a few thoughts that uh, came to me. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, being the soldiers who crucified him. And he parted his garment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, derided, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors who was crucified with him rallied him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that art in the same condemnation? And if we indeed, and we indeed justly, for we, uh, right, sorry about that, um, but this man had done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And from John, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, and his mother, and the wife of uh, Cleo- Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And the last one. And all his acquaintances and women who followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. You have to forgive me this morning for stumbling. Just a little bit. Um, it's hard to fight back to tears. It's hard to fight the emotions. It's hard to uh, bring forth what I want to bring forth this morning. But uh, my brother Rex, in his opening prayer this morning, pretty well nailed it what I wanted to bring. He asked that I may stand and speak boldly. And that's part of what I wanted to bring this morning. When I was reading the scriptures and studying them, I have a habit sometimes of making myself or putting myself as the character in, in whatever I'm reading. So in the first case, I was the man on the left side of Christ. I was the man on the right side. I was one of the Roman soldiers that crucified him. I was among the crowd that cheered him on. And this way I try to get a better perspective as what was taking place. And I will admit I would never put myself upon the cross of Jesus. But I try to put myself in the place of the others. And the question kept coming to me, which one are you, Mark? 
Are you one of the Roman soldiers that crucified Christ? Are you one of the crowd that cheered him on? Are you the man on the right or the left? And if you study those people, what happened? I didn't finish the scriptures. I'll have you do that. But if you examine it, and the question was, which one are you today, Mark? And which one are you going to become? You see, the man that stood uh, hanging by the cross that rebuked Christ went along with the crowd. He went along with the chants and the cheering. And if you read what he asked Christ, he more or less, what he was doing, he was uh, goading him. He was challenging in him. And for what reason? He didn't want to see if he was the true son of God. He said, if you are, then bring me down from this cross. And I thought about that for a few minutes. Am I that man? Have I ever been that man? Have I ever challenged God to prove to me that he is who he is or Jesus Christ? I hope not. But there have been times in my sorrowful life that I've out of sorrow asked God why? Why me? Why my family? Why this? Why, why, why? Is that not the same? Or am I the second man that rebuked him? That realized he was the son of God. He was innocent. His blood spilled was innocent. And admitted to Christ that he was a sinful man. And we know what Christ did. He forgave him. And what is he telling? Today, my son, you will be with me in paradise. Because of your faith. Sometimes I have to ask myself, where is my faith? And if you continue, the soldiers that drew lots for his garments, at the end of what, again, you finish the scriptures, I don't have time. Well, I do, but I don't want to take up the time. They too realized they spilled innocent blood. The multitude that were there chanting, crucify him, realize their error. Brothers and sisters, this don't realize our error when it's too late. And to help understand or get my point across even better, the second set of scriptures I shared, when Christ was on the cross and he said he looked down, he only beheld a handful of people. Remember, the rest of the multitude were against him. Crucifying, crucifying. But what I find interesting, it says one disciple, one that he loved. Now we can debate this all day, but it's not the point. I believe it was uh, John the Beloved. So the question is, and I do believe the other scripture I shared tells us, where were the other disciples? Where were the other ten? If John was at the foot of the cross, we know that one was gone. So there's ten other disciples. Where were they? Were they hiding in shame and embarrassment? Were they hiding amongst the crowd? Or were they standing very boldly as John, as Rex spoke? See, brothers and sisters, it takes boldness to stand this day. Not only on my part, but on yours as well. Because that's what Christ is calling us today to do, is to stand bold, to stand tall, to align ourselves with him, and not be afar off and be ashamed or embarrassed or in fear of our life. 
it's easy for us to come here today, gather today, to stand boldly. But that's what I'm asking myself. Once I leave these doors, how bold will I stand? Will I be there for my Christ? It's a lot of inner digging. Just a few moments ago, we shared in the emblems. Brian talked about a commitment, a vow that we have taken, that Christ has taken with us. And we did that at our baptism. We told our God that we would follow him, that we would boldly stand up and be his disciple. Did we not? That vow would not be broken by our Heavenly Father. His vow to you is His Son, Jesus Christ. His devotion to us was His Son, Jesus Christ. That we may come to Him and ask for forgiveness, even as that man on the cross did. I have sat out there and listened to many of my peers. Recently, my brother Howard. Today, you are forgiven. But it's up to us as to what disciple we will become. Which man on that cross are we going to be? Or woman? It's up to us to make that decision. God will never take that away from us. As I was reading these um, accounts of the crucifixion, I don't think you can do it without weeping tears. I can only imagine the pain and the suffering that our Lord and Savior went through for us. And I, I can't. I just can't imagine. Right now, I stand before you in somewhat pain. Uh, you might see my hands. They're bandaged. They're uh, down to the, to the bare. Uh, my skin is gone because of the work I've been doing around my house. They're painful, as all of you may know. But can you imagine the pain and suffering our Lord Jesus Christ went through? And he went through it for you and me. And we do it again, gladly. He's asking us today to stand bold, to stand tall, to follow him. A few weeks ago, I had the, the privilege to spend nine beautiful and wonderful days at Camp Osceola with the Boy Scouts. If you have been there, know that was sarcastic. But during one of those uh, times, I uh, found myself engaged in counseling one of our young scouts in one of the citizenship merit badges. And I was explaining to this young man the importance of being a good citizen and how we should uh, try to do better to become the best citizen we could be, just as we should try to be the best person we can be. They go hand in hand. The best, well, I'm going to say Christian. I'm going to use that term very loosely. But the best person we can be. And in doing so, I use an illustration with him that life is like an elevator. We all know that God opens up doors for us each and every day of our lives. And it's up to us to whether we uh, open or enter that door. But when we get on that elevator of life, we have many choices to make. One, do we step on it? Two, when we get on that elevator, which button do I push? There are many, many people, many, many functions, many, many things that are begging you to push that down button. 
They want to see you go down. They want to see you fail. So we have that choice. But once we enter that, our Heavenly Father is asking us to push the up button. And as we grow taller and taller, more mature, we continue to push the up button. There is no penthouse suite, but there is the kingdom of God. He's encouraging us, as I did that young man, to continue to push the up button. The other option we have is don't get on. Stay on the floor we're on. And what happens there? We become stale, stagnant. We're happy with ourselves, where we are in our lives. We may be happy with that, but our Heavenly Father is not. He's calling us and beckoning us today and opening that door for us and the opportunity to come to Him. Knock and it shall be opened. Push the upper button. Stand bold and tall. Be that disciple that He wants you to be. And be that man that does not mock Him, but the one that comes to Him asking for forgiveness. That is what he's asking us today. So I'll leave you with one scripture and again the thought. Stand tall and bold. No servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammoth. Stand tall and bold.
our Heavenly Father. We would pause at this time to uh, thank you for that revelation that you have shed within our souls. Even charity, the pure love of Christ. For we uh, have come to consider this a great gift, if not the greatest. For we know that there is nothing more powerful in this universe than that love. Under the impetus of that love, you have gathered our families out from the world that we would come and prepare for Zion. And as we have spent time one with another and come to know each other, we have found that we love one another. And as we have done that with, uh, within the confines of your spirit, we find that our souls are raised up and there is a closeness and a unity that comes from you. Now the path. Has not been easy. We have known the pressures of life. We have known losses of those we love. And yet through it all, there is a joy that comes from charity. And so I would pray that you would grant that we may come forth out of obscurity and stand forth as Ephraim, as Benjamin in this latter day, as the house of Israel. And that we would stand as with boldness as Mark has spoken. Not being ashamed among the profane people with which we uh, have to interact on a daily basis. But that we, through the power of that love, would live and shine even as our Christ. And that we, having brought the pettiness of our souls this day and put them at the foot of the cross, would walk forth in the beauty of his love. That we would not be cast down but that we would walk seeing Zion towards your purpose, encouraging one another and praying for one another and reaching into one another's lives that we might strengthen and uphold. Let us be as Nephi of old, who told his father that he would go and do the things that he was commanded because he knew that you would not give a commandment save you could prepare a way that it may be fulfilled. Let us walk in such a faith. We pray that you would send righteousness down from heaven into our souls and into the world, that you would bring more light and truth from the earth. And we would pray these things in the anticipation of faith in the name of our Savior, even Emmanuel. Amen.